Part 1 You will hear three different extracts. For questions 1 to 6, choose the answer A, B or C which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract 1 You hear part of an interview with Dr Cooper, an expert on Greek mythology. To profess to know how everything, even life itself, began represents a claim to more than everyday knowledge. Ancient Greek poets were one group who might stake such a claim. The earliest surviving example of Greek cosmogonical speculation is Hesiod's Theogony, written either in the 8th or 7th century BC. Here with us today to approach this complex narrative in some detail is archaeologist and expert on Greek mythology, Dr. Nicholas Cooper. Dr. Cooper. How did everything begin? At the beginning of everything, there was chaos. Not in the sense of disorder rather than chasm. A gaping space. Afterwards came Gaia and Eros. Correct me if I'm wrong. Gaia represents the Earth and Eros love, right? Right. And it was upon these two that the procreation of everything and everyone was dependent. Next, there came into being more spatial and temporal features which define the world. Chaos generated Erebus and Night, who then produced Ether and Day. Gaia produced the Titans after her union with Uranus, and this is one of the most significant events, so to speak, for later developments. What made it so significant? Well, let's say that the scene was set for one of the poem's central themes, succession. Uranus sought to prevent his children from emerging into the light. Cronus was the youngest of his children and the most devious of all offspring. He succeeded in overthrowing his father and taking his place. The story is repeated with Zeus, Cronus' youngest son. We all know how Cronus had an appetite for children and how Rhea tried to protect her son from falling prey to his father. To that end, she visited the island of Crete where she bore her son and wrapped a stone in swaddling clothes to fool the voracious father. To profess to know how everything, even life itself, began represents a claim to more than everyday knowledge. Ancient Greek poets were one group who might stake such a claim. The earliest surviving example of Greek cosmogonical speculation is Hesiod's Theogony, written either in the 8th or 7th century BC. Here with us today to approach this complex narrative in some detail is archaeologist and expert on Greek mythology, Dr. Nicholas Cooper. Dr. Cooper. How did everything begin? At the beginning of everything, there was chaos. Not in the sense of disorder rather than chasm, a gaping space. Afterwards came Gaia and Eros. Correct me if I'm wrong. Gaia represents the Earth and Eros love, right? Right. And it was upon these two that the procreation of everything and everyone was dependent. Next, there came into being more spatial and temporal features which define the world. Chaos generated Erebus and Night, who then produced Ether and Day. Gaia produced the Titans after her union with Uranus, and this is one of the most significant events, so to speak, for later developments. What made it so significant? Well, let's say that the scene was set for one of the poem's central themes, succession. Uranus sought to prevent his children from emerging into the light. Cronus was the youngest of his children and the most devious of all offspring. He succeeded in overthrowing his father and taking his place. The story is repeated with Zeus, Cronus' youngest son. We all know how Cronus had an appetite for children and how Rhea tried to protect her son from falling prey to his father. To that end, she visited the island of Crete where she bore her son and wrapped a stone in swaddling clothes to fool the voracious father. Extract 2. You hear Dr. Stewart, an expert on Japanese theatre.
The word no is derived from no, meaning talent or skill, and is unlike Western narrative drama. Rather than being actors or representators in the Western sense, no performers are simply storytellers who use their appearances and their movements to imply the essence of their tale rather than to enact it. Little takes place in a no drama, and the total effect is less than that of a present action, a simile or metaphor made visual. The educated spectators know the story's plot very well, so that what they appreciate are the symbols and subtle allusions to Japanese cultural history contained in the words and movements. No developed from ancient forms of dance drama and from various types of festival drama at shrines and temples that had emerged by the 12th or 13th century. It went on to become a distinctive form in the 14th century and was continually refined up to the years of the Tokugawa period from 1603 to 1867. It then became a ceremonial drama performed on auspicious occasions by professional actors for the warrior class as in a sense a prayer for peace, longevity and the prosperity of the social elite. Outside the noble houses, however, there were performances that popular audiences could attend. The collapse of the feudal order, with the Meiji Restoration in 1868, threatened the existence of No, though a few notable actors maintained its traditions. After World War II, the interest of a larger audience led to a revival of the form. There are five types of No plays. The first type, the Kami play, involves a sacred story of a Shinto shrine. The second, Shuramono, centers on warriors. The third, Katsuramono, has a female protagonist. The fourth type is more varied in content and includes the Jendai Mono, in which the story is contemporary and realistic rather than legendary and supernatural, and the Kyojo Mono, in which the protagonist becomes insane through the loss of a lover or child. And the fifth type, the Kiri or Kichiku play, features devils, strange beasts and supernatural beings. Two factors have allowed Nor to be transmitted from generation to generation, yet remain fairly close to earlier forms. First, the preservation of texts which contain detailed recitations, dance, mime and music. And second, the direct and fairly exact transmission of performing skills. On the other hand, nor was subject to the changing preferences of new audiences and new styles and patterns inevitably evolved. The word no is derived from no meaning talent or skill and is unlike Western narrative drama. Rather than being actors or representators in the Western sense, no performers are simply storytellers who use their appearances and their movements to imply the essence of their tale rather than to enact it. Little takes place in a no drama, and the total effect is less than that of a present action, a simile or metaphor made visual. The educated spectators know the story's plot very well, so that what they appreciate are the symbols and subtle allusions to Japanese cultural history contained in the words and movements. No, developed from ancient forms of dance drama and from various types of festival drama at shrines and temples that had emerged by the 12th or 13th century. It went on to become a distinctive form in the 14th century and was continually refined up to the years of the Tokugawa period from 1603 to 1867. It then became a ceremonial drama performed on auspicious occasions by professional actors for the warrior class as in a sense a prayer for peace, longevity and the prosperity of the social elite. Outside the noble houses, however, there were performances that popular audiences could attend. The collapse of the feudal order, with the Meiji Restoration in 1868, threatened the existence of No, though a few notable actors maintained its traditions. After World War II, the interest of a larger audience led to a revival of the form. There are five types of No plays. The first type, the Kami play, involves a sacred story of a Shinto shrine. The second, Shuramono, centers on warriors. The third, Katsuramono, has a female protagonist. The fourth type is more varied in content and includes the Jendai Mono, 
in which the story is contemporary and realistic rather than legendary and supernatural, and the Kyojo Mono, in which the protagonist becomes insane through the loss of a lover or child. And the fifth type, the Kiri or Kichiku play, features devils, strange beasts and supernatural beings. Two factors have allowed Noor to be transmitted from generation to generation, yet remain fairly close to earlier forms. First, the preservation of texts which contain detailed recitations, dance, mime and music. And second, the direct and fairly exact transmission of performing skills. On the other hand, Noor was subject to the changing preferences of new audiences and new styles and patterns inevitably evolved. Extract 3 You hear part of an interview with Dr Fritz, an expert on the Northern Lights. Many people are intrigued by the beauty of Northern Cellars, and I think that the light in the sky in the North Pole is a reason why many tourists like visiting these Arctic and Antarctic regions. In order to learn more about this phenomenon, Dr. Fritz is here today to fill us in on the creation of this polar light. Well, this light is a phenomenon that can take place in the Earth's magnetosphere, which is the region of space surrounding the Earth that consists of particles controlled by the Earth's magnetic field. When a disturbance is caused by a solar wind shock wave, a geomagnetic storm is caused, thus creating the light we see in the sky at the poles of the Earth. This happens because solar wind pressure is exerted on the Earth's magnetic field, which leads to an increase in the electric current in the magnetosphere. What exactly is that disturbance? The disturbance is actually caused by the Sun. The main role of the magnetosphere is to protect us from the particles emitted by the Sun. So, if some particles succeed in penetrating the magnetosphere, they hit the atmosphere over the poles. Then a magnetic storm is created on the surface of the Earth as the magnetic field strength decreases. This can last up to 12 hours, but the magnetic field gradually recovers over a period of several days. What are the main causes of such disturbances? A disturbance can be caused by a coronal mass ejection, which is an eruption caused on the surface of the Sun and can be released in the form of a large cloud of plasma and magnetic field. It is possible that such clouds can be created at any time and in any direction, and only when they are aimed at Earth can they have an impact on it. Another reason geomagnetic storms are created is a high-speed solar wind stream. This comes from coronal holes, which are dark areas on the Sun's surface where the solar magnetic field experiences lower density. How often does the Earth experience a geomagnetic storm? This depends on the sunspot cycle. Sunspots are some other dark areas on the surface of the Sun which contain strong magnetic fields. These areas cool slightly and they are constantly rotating. This rotation or cycle can take about 27 days to complete. Which phenomena are associated with a geomagnetic storm? A proton storm is caused when protons are emitted by the Sun and then penetrate the Earth's magnetic field causing ionization. This can result in disturbances in radio and telecommunications as well as in navigation where magnetic compasses are used. Many people are intrigued by the beauty of Northern Cellars and I think that the light in the sky in the North Pole is a reason why many tourists like visiting these Arctic and Antarctic regions. In order to learn more about this phenomenon, Dr. Fritz is here today to fill us in on the creation of this polar light. Well, this light is a phenomenon that can take place in the Earth's magnetosphere, which is the region of space surrounding the Earth that consists of particles controlled by the Earth's magnetic field. When a disturbance is caused by a solar wind shock wave, a geomagnetic storm is caused, thus creating the light we see in the sky at the poles of the Earth. This happens because solar wind pressure is exerted on the Earth's magnetic field, which leads to an increase in the electric current in the magnetosphere. What exactly is that disturbance? The disturbance is actually caused by the Sun. The main role of the magnetosphere is to protect us from the particles emitted by the Sun. 
So, if some particles succeed in penetrating the magnetosphere, they hit the atmosphere over the poles. Then a magnetic storm is created on the surface of the Earth as the magnetic field strength decreases. This can last up to 12 hours, but the magnetic field gradually recovers over a period of several days. What are the main causes of such disturbances? A disturbance can be caused by a coronal mass ejection, which is an eruption caused on the surface of the Sun and can be released in the form of a large cloud of plasma and magnetic field. It is possible that such clouds can be created at any time and in any direction, and only when they're aimed at Earth can they have an impact on it. Another reason geomagnetic storms are created is a high-speed solar wind stream. This comes from coronal holes, which are dark areas on the Sun's surface where the solar magnetic field experiences lower density. How often does the Earth experience a geomagnetic storm? This depends on the sunspot cycle. Sunspots are some other dark areas on the surface of the Sun which contain strong magnetic fields. These areas cool slightly and they are constantly rotating. This rotation or cycle can take about 27 days to complete. Which phenomena are associated with a geomagnetic storm? A proton storm is caused when protons are emitted by the Sun and then penetrate the Earth's magnetic field causing ionisation. This can result in disturbances in radio and telecommunications as well as in navigation where magnetic compasses are used. That is the end of part 1. Now turn to part 2. Part 2 You will hear a lecturer talking about speech errors. For questions 7 to 15, Complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You now have 45 seconds to look at part 2. The tip of the tongue state afflicts us, so to speak, when despite the fact that we know fairly well what the word is, in fact we can provide the first and the last syllables correctly, we fail to utter the word. This state is characterised by strong feelings of knowing what the specific word is. Two theories attempting to account for the causes of TOTs have recently emerged. The partial activation and blocking or interference hypotheses. According to the first hypothesis, the intended words are inaccessible by virtue of the fact that they are weakly represented in the system, which results in the retrieval deficit. The blocking hypothesis, on the other hand, holds that a stronger competitor, phonological or semantic, suppresses the intended word. So far, we can see that the study of the tip of the tongue state has proved more promising as it has been instrumental in offering some hints as to what may be going on in speech planning. However, since the evidence provided is far from conclusive, we should now turn to speech errors, an area of study which has yielded some very interesting and insightful results in respect of the finer levels of planning and execution that deal with the formation of words, syllables and sounds. Now you'll hear part two again. The tip of the tongue state afflicts us, so to speak, when despite the fact that we know fairly well what the word is, in fact we can provide the first and the last syllables correctly, we fail to utter the word. This state is characterised by strong feelings of knowing what the specific word is. Two theories attempting to account for the causes of TOTs have recently emerged. The partial activation 
and blocking or interference hypotheses. According to the first hypothesis, the intended words are inaccessible by virtue of the fact that they are weakly represented in the system, which results in the retrieval deficit. The blocking hypothesis, on the other hand, holds that a stronger competitor, phonological or semantic, suppresses the intended word. So far, we can see that the study of the tip of the tongue state has proved more promising as it has been instrumental in offering some hints as to what may be going on in speech planning. However, since the evidence provided is far from conclusive, we should now turn to speech errors, an area of study which has yielded some very interesting and insightful results in respect of the finer levels of planning and execution that deal with the formation of words, syllables and sounds. That is the end of part two. Now turn to part three. Part three. You will hear a discussion between a man and a woman. For questions 16 to 20, choose the answer A, B, C or D, which fits best according to what you hear. You now have one minute to look at part three. We can't afford this kind of holiday. Forget it. Gone are the days when we frittered money away on unnecessary things, sumptuous chalets and expensive dinners. Now we have to make do with a few days at the beach. That's why I insist that we buy the caravan we saw the other day. Its price is unbeatable, and you won't have to worry about sharing the toilet with my mother. That's reason enough to consider the option. You're unbearable. Anyway, since summer is just around the corner, we have to make provisions. I mean, we have to make up our minds about what we're going to do in August. Are we buying the caravan and going to Cornwall? Or are we going to Greece? Greece? When did that come up? Listen carefully. If we buy a caravan, that means that it's going to set us back £8,000. Yet it will pay off in the long run. We won't have to pay for accommodation. We won't be forced to eat at restaurants during our holiday. We'll cook in the caravan. However, if we don't buy a caravan which means if we don't spend £8,000, I guess we could go to Greece and visit a couple of islands. It's a must, believe me. Says who? Says me. Don't forget that we've never done anything for ourselves. Going to Greece has never been on the agenda, as far as I remember. I know the kids would love to, but besides, I've got a loan to pay off. It's £3,000. I know, but you said you're saving for it. You earned 5000 last month. Demand for builders is on the wax and wane, so I can't really tell how much I earn every month. You know that. Do you want to stay here working while I'm in Greece with the kids? That's an option. So, you don't mind, do you? I'm sure you've got ulterior motive. Such as? We'll discuss it later. Now, as far as the caravan is concerned, I think it's the best solution as it's going to come in handy over the long haul, whether you like it or not. If we buy it, we'll need extra upkeep money. Yes, but this cost won't exceed three to four hundred quid per year. Depends how often you'll need to holiday, darling. Some it won't be enough for you. Now you'll hear part three again. We can't afford this kind of holiday. Forget it. Gone are the days when we frittered money away on unnecessary things, sumptuous chalets and expensive dinners. 
Now we have to make do with a few days at the beach. That's why I insist that we buy the caravan we saw the other day. Its price is unbeatable, and you won't have to worry about sharing the toilet with my mother. That's reason enough to consider the option. You're unbearable. Anyway, since summer is just around the corner, we have to make provisions. I mean, we have to make up our minds about what we're going to do in August. Are we buying the caravan and going to Cornwall, or are we going to Greece? Greece. When did that come up? Listen carefully. If we buy a caravan, that means that it's going to set us back eight thousand pounds. Yet it will pay off in the long run. We won't have to pay for accommodation. We won't be forced to eat at restaurants during our holiday. We'll cook in the caravan. However, if we don't buy a caravan, which means if we don't spend eight thousand pounds, I guess we could go to Greece and visit a couple of islands. It's a must, believe me. Says who? Says me. Don't forget that we've never done anything for ourselves. Going to Greece has never been on the agenda, as far as I remember. I know the kids would love to, but besides, I've got a loan to pay off. It's three thousand pounds. I know, but you said you're saving for it. You earned five thousand last month. Demand for builders is on the wax and wane, so I can't really tell how much I earn every month. You know that. Do you want to stay here working while I'm in Greece with the kids? That's an option. So you don't mind, do you? I'm sure you've got ulterior motives, such as. We'll discuss it later. Now, as far as the caravan is concerned, I think it's the best solution, as it's going to come in handy over the long haul, whether you like it or not. If we buy it, we'll need extra upkeep money. Yes, but this cost won't exceed three to four hundred quid per year. Depends how often you need to holiday, darling. Some it won't be enough for you. That is the end of part three. Now turn to part four. Part four. Part four consists of two parts. You will hear five short extracts in which teenagers are talking about unemployment. Look at task one. For questions twenty-one to twenty-five, choose from the list A to H what each speaker says about unemployment. Now look at task two. For questions twenty-six to thirty, choose from the list A to H what each speaker says about their dreams and wants. You now have forty-five seconds to look at part four. Speaker one. I don't have any hands-on experience, but I'm afraid I will shortly. I've been thinking of juggling a part-time job and studying when I'm admitted to the uni I'm interested in. I keep my fingers crossed I'll find a decent job around my area. To be frank, I'd like to live on my own, but my parents are opposed to it as they feel I won't make it. They keep saying that I won't find a well-paid job before I graduate, so it would be wise to stay with them for another three to four years. It will be difficult for me as I want to be independent. The economic crisis scares me a bit. I feel others will take advantage of me. I'm eager to do all sorts of jobs. I don't really mind as long as I make enough money to cover my needs. Most of my friends can't find a job in Liverpool. Speaker two. I get the feeling that newspapers and the media blow all this out of proportion. Are things as serious as they have us believe? I doubt it. If you want to work, you'll find a job sooner or later, as long as you don't get your hopes up too high. I know what things are like out there, so I'll probably start working at my father's office. Three to four hours a day will be ideal at first, but if I find it interesting, I may stay there for much longer till I land another job. My parents insist on my studying maths or medicine. 
but I'm not a very good student. I'd rather be a fitness instructor. I have to study for a couple of years, of course, but it won't be that difficult. No, I don't care about unemployment. I know I'll stand on my own feet. Speaker 3 I don't want to think about the future. It's too early, isn't it? I won't be the only one looking for a job, right? After all, I speak two foreign languages, so I think I can move to another country. Why live in England for the rest of my life? There are far better job prospects abroad. A friend of mine works in Singapore. He's a merchant. I'm sure he can find a decent job for me if I decide to relocate. I've always wanted to live in Asia. I learn Malay or Chinese and stay there for as long as it takes. A rolling stone gathers no moss. I'm quite frugal, so I don't need a lot of money. The salary to live on is more than enough for me. There's no such thing as unemployment for those who are eager to explore the world. Speaker 4 No, it's not only politicians to blame for unemployment. Everybody is. We need, we think we need more and more things. So our salaries end up shrinking. We want more expensive cars and bigger houses. We are mad about exclusive resorts and long excursions. We settle for nothing less than fashionable clothes. We don't care about love and communication. We only care about material wealth. We want to be successful, but we don't want to work hard. Well, I want to do something that will make others happy. And making others happy will make myself happy, too. I don't want to be tied to an office. I want to travel a lot and inspire others. I play the guitar, so I guess I could travel abroad and sing, meet new people, this sort of thing. Who cares about unemployment rates? Life is out there. Speaker 5 I am graduating from high school in a few months' time and I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'll set up my own online shop selling things I make by myself. If all this works out, I can save up money and travel the world. I don't want to go to university for at least another couple of years. I prefer to live in another country and become part of their culture. I know my country's economy is not very strong, but I'm confident. I don't let fear stop me from realising my dreams. I'm too young to be scared. I know I can do something big with several friends of mine. Tom's a great inventor, so I'm sure we can come up with something revolutionary. Who knows? Maybe we'll run an online channel or an innovative application. Sky's the limit. Now you'll hear part four again. Speaker one. I don't have any hands-on experience, but I'm afraid I will, shortly. I've been thinking of juggling a part-time job and studying when I'm admitted to the uni I'm interested in. I keep my fingers crossed I'll find a decent job around my area. To be frank, I'd like to live on my own, but my parents are opposed to it as they feel I won't make it. They keep saying that I won't find a well-paid job before I graduate, so it would be wise to stay with them for another three to four years. It will be difficult for me as I want to be independent. The economic crisis scares me a bit. I feel others will take advantage of me. I'm eager to do all sorts of jobs. I don't really mind as long as I make enough money to cover my needs. Most of my friends can't find a job in Liverpool. Speaker 2 I get the feeling that newspapers and the media blow all this out of proportion. Are things as serious as they have us believe? I doubt it. If you want to work, you'll find a job, sooner or later, as long as you don't get your hopes up too high. I know what things are like out there, so I'll probably start working at my father's office. Three to four hours a day will be ideal at first, but if I find it interesting, I may stay there for much longer, till I land another job. My parents insist on my studying maths or medicine, but I'm not a very good student. I'd rather be a fitness instructor. I have to study for a couple of years, of course, but it won't be that difficult. No, I don't care about unemployment. I know I'll stand on my own feet. Speaker 3 I don't want to think about the future. It's too early, isn't it? I won't be the only one looking for a job, right? After all, I speak two foreign languages, so I think I can move to another country. Why live in England for the rest of my life? There are far better job prospects abroad. A friend of mine works in Singapore. He's a merchant. I'm sure he can find a decent job for me if I decide to relocate. 
I've always wanted to live in Asia. I learn Malay or Chinese and stay there for as long as it takes. A rolling stone gathers no moss. I'm quite frugal, so I don't need a lot of money. The salary to live on is more than enough for me. There's no such thing as unemployment for those who are eager to explore the world. Speaker 4 No, it's not only politicians to blame for unemployment. Everybody is. We need, we think we need more and more things. So our salaries end up shrinking. We want more expensive cars and bigger houses. We are mad about exclusive resorts and long excursions. We settle for nothing less than fashionable clothes. We don't care about love and communication. We only care about material wealth. We want to be successful, but we don't want to work hard. Well, I want to do something that will make others happy. And making others happy will make myself happy, too. I don't want to be tied to an office. I want to travel a lot and inspire others. I play the guitar. So I guess I could travel abroad and sing, meet new people, this sort of thing. Who cares about unemployment rates? Life is out there. Speaker 5 I am graduating from high school in a few months' time and I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'll set up my own online shop selling things I make by myself. If all this works out, I can save up money and travel the world. I don't want to go to university for at least another couple of years. I prefer to live in another country and become part of their culture. I know my country's economy is not very strong, but I'm confident. I don't let fear stop me from realising my dreams. I'm too young to be scared. I know I can do something big with several friends of mine. Tom's a great inventor, so I'm sure we can come up with something revolutionary. Who knows? Maybe we'll run an online channel or an innovative application. Sky's the limit.